I'm really pleased to be able to, to speak to Carol Gobi today. Um, she's come on to talk about um, the, the secret family court and the, the system um, and how it has impacted on her and her family over the over recent years, over the last 10 years. Um, at the moment, I'm I'm trying to shine a light onto what the family court are doing to, to families all over the world. Um, and it's nothing short of atrocious. So um, without further ado, Carol, um, thanks for coming on today. Can you um, start off by kind of describing a bit about yourself and you know your background and then if we get on to what's happened to you and your family um well I'm I'm in Luxembourg Europe I came here in 2006 after marriage um and um it was an abusive marriage and then in 2011 um my ex now my ex said that um, he's, he told me that my mother called him a pedophile. And uh, I then realized that before marriage, he also told me something similar, but saying two different people were saying uh, he prefers little boys. And when I confronted him over it, he exploded. He became, he became threatening, saying that he was going to sue me and he was going to sue my mother. And um, at that point, I said, okay, why is your hands in my children's crutches? Because this was something he did for years, uh, uh, you know, with the children is he would uh, grab their crutches during play, what he called play. And um, when I asked him to stop, at that point, I just said, you know, stop, I don't like it. He would uh, have justifications, for example, that his father also played with him like this. So it's normal. He, he tried to create the impression that it's normal. Later, I heard when, you know, life further down the road or years later, I heard that this is actually called grooming. Not just grooming of the child, but also grooming of the adult who's, you know, uh, responsible for the child. But anyway, um, at that point, I started telling my children to, um, you know, that nobody's allowed to touch them in their privates and they're not allowed to touch anybody else. And they didn't say anything. But five months later, my children said to me that um, daddy makes food from his penis and he puts it in my mouth. This was my eldest child. And my middle child, who was three years old, said daddy puts the food in my buttocks. And that was when I, you know, I said, okay, this, <laughs> you know, it's, it's too much for me. And I um, went to a child welfare organization asking them to evaluate my children and they refused. And he started walking around telling people that I'm mentally unstable, violent and dangerous, and that he fears for his life and for the children's lives from me. Um, and that he's forced, he goes away for business. And he was saying he's forced, you know, to, to, to make an income to leave the children in, in my care, you know, for months at a time, for weeks at a time, sorry, not months, but you know, because he had to, he said, because, you know, for an income, which was absolute trash. I mean, he was booking himself on voluntary business trips. Um, but these people believed him with, with no, you know, no investigation, no nothing. And then he started telling all kinds of crazy stories, exaggerating, lying. I mean, um, I went to the police a few days after my children had told me that the child welfare organization who I went to refused to, to evaluate the children. Um, sent me to a doctor who would supposedly um, medically examine the children. He refused to examine the three-year-old who was saying that his father puts the food in his buttocks. He refused to examine him and he referred us to a child psychologist. And um, this, my ex was going everywhere. I mean, everywhere I was going to try and get answers, he was with, you know, he was going with, and he was there and he had the child on his, you know, carrying the child on his neck. I'll never forget this. And um, when I got to the child psychologist, a Dr. Schelling in Luxembourg, uh, the doctor who was medically examining was Dr. Zeligman, who refused to examine the three-year-old. Um, when I got to this Dr. Schelling, as she said to me, no, she was not asked. When I asked her, I still have custody of my children. I asked her, you know, would you, uh, you know, I suspect my children have been sexually abused. 
these are the symptoms. I had a long list, made a long list of symptoms of these children, their tantrums, their nightmares, you know, the, the smearing of excretion, the sexualized behavior, you know, trying to push things into each other's anuses, things like this when they're yeah. in the shower. That children it, just don't do unless something's unless mm -mm. abused, let's face it. What children do that unless they're being abused? Yeah, the thing is, when I, when I found my children doing these things, um, because I would, I would be out of the room and when I come back, they would be busy doing these things. And when I confronted them and I said, you know, this is wrong. And, and my eldest would say, it is, like he's confused. And the three-year-old old would say, I like it. And I think, but it, you know, I, where do you get this? It's as if they, you know, they, they're used to this. Yeah. And, uh, but I know nothing. And um, then... Um, this Dr. Schilling refused to, to evaluate my children uh, for sexualization. She said to me, I was only asked to see if the middle child is autistic. The three-year-old is autistic. And I'm thinking, but I didn't ask you Why, who? to see if the child's autistic. I'm sitting right in front of her yeah. and I'm asking yeah. to evaluate my children for sexualization. She refuses. Then she decided in 20 minutes that the three-year-old is not autistic and that apparently later on in reports, I discovered she decided that this mother is mentally unstable. There's another source. Yeah, so um, then my ex filed for divorce three weeks after I, I, I went to the police, sorry, a few days after he had told this. And um, with a struggle, I phoned the police first and said, this is what my children had told me, what must I do? And the police officer, Mr. Weiss, said to me, no, you don't need to come in to report this. <laughs> so I was like, sorry, what? So was on the telephone, he said that to you. Yeah, on the telephone. So I went to a different police station. This was youth protection police. This is in, in French. It was a French-speaking country. And um, so I went to a different police station. I thought, this, this can't be normal. And uh, I, I said to the police officer there, you know, this is what my children had told me. And they said, oh, no, no, you need to go to that section because we don't deal with this. And I said, but I found them. And the guy said, I don't need to come in. And then they phoned him. And then he said, OK, you know, you can come in. And he arranged for a translator. That was a Friday. He arranged for a, a translator on the Monday. And uh, because he couldn't speak our language properly. He couldn't speak English, basically, properly. But he, it, my children also speak our native language. It's not English. Yeah. So they, you know, were only fluent or could express themselves properly in, in our native language. And um, so he had to arrange a translator. She was not certified, I found out later. Um, and they interviewed my eldest child, who was a shy, shy child, who covered his face while he was, was disclosing things to me. Um, in a conference room, you know, these strangers were, had him in the conference room, and he apparently denied that, you know, his father is molesting him, or that making food from his penis and putting it in his mouth. And um, I never saw this recording. I'm only told he denied. Right. Never saw it. Not allowed to. Yeah. And then they came out and said, okay, you know, where's the hamster? <laughs> I had allowed my children to take a pet hamster with them to the police station to distract them and occupy them. Okay. While I was talking, they had the hamster. Okay. And this <laughs> became the focal point to them. Where is the hamster? Yeah, Why so I, I was saying, aren't you going to interview my three-year-old? They say, no, no, where is the hamster? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, like, I'm not getting this. And I'm saying, my three-year-old also told me he's being sexually and They say, no, 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 we're not going to interview him. Where's the hamster? And um, then after that, um, the, the abuse in the house basically became like <laughs> 100% worse from this guy. I mean, he was just, this was actually after he had told me my mother called him a pedophile that he was just this became. Towards so yourself, the, the abuse towards you. Sorry? Was this the abuse that he, you, your ex husband towards you? He was being more abusive with you or the children or both? Oh, both. Okay. He would walk past a child and he would just push the child over. Wow. Yeah. Backwards. I mean, he would literally just walk past the child and push the child over. He he locked a, um, the three-year-old in the garage, in the dark garage, because he didn't 
react quick quick enough when he told him to come in. And when he came in, the child actually came in, he closed the garage door behind the child and he closed the, the, the inside garage door on the child and he locked him in. And it's dark. It's a dark garage. Yeah. And I only heard the child screaming. And when I, when I went down, he was standing, crossed arms in front of the door. And I said to him, what are you doing? And he said, he didn't listen to me when I spoke. Yeah. And another time he... Um, I also heard the same child, for some reason he was on that child. I heard him scream, I went upstairs and he had the child on his bed and the child was just screaming. And I went and sat next to the child and um, he said to me, go away. And I said, no, I'm not going to go away. And um, he said to me, it looks like I need to tighten the bolts on you. Now, this is a phrase where it means increased pressure. It's it's okay, yeah. And um, uh, he basically went on about how the child doesn't listen to him, and you know, etc. And when I, I picked the child up and I walked out, and when I went out, my eldest said to him, "He, the th three-year-old, didn't look at his father while he was speaking to him, and this was why he gave him a hiding, <laughs> beat him for not." looking at him while he was speaking. It's just, it's mind blowing. I mean, the behavior is just mind blowing. But anyway, so after I had been to the police, uh, this guy, um, yeah, th things just went absolutely crazy. This guy filed for a divorce. Um, I got the papers uh, about three weeks after I had been to the police. And in that time, my children started disclosing more stuff. And um, they started saying that he takes them to a place where there's other people who do the same as, as he does. And they called the place the zoo. I, you know, there were three and five. I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't make out or understand what they were saying. They were saying that the animals bite. The three-year-old was saying to me, the animals bite. Um, I would ask, but, you know, <laughs> are the people dressed like animals? because they say they're men and women and other children yeah. and I would think but are, are, they, are they dressed like animals and, and he would say no but they bite um, my eldest had more you know detail he was saying there's there's bedrooms and the bedding has spots on it and he would name people who's also there friends of this guy and um, neighbors <laughs> for example um, he said to me that a lady up in the street stayed with him amongst the people at this place once. And I said, but where was your father? And he said, no, he leaves us alone amongst the people while he's up front doing his bad things. And I tried to get out of this child, what, you know, take what happens at this place? Because it just, it was just, it blew my mind. And um, he would say to me, they sing. And I think, okay, maybe the child's confused with church. <laughs> and I said to him, okay, well, do they smoke there? <laughs> and he said to me, yes, they smoke. So I thought, okay, well, it's not in church because people in church don't smoke. So it's not church. And they would say things to me like, because uh, they were saying to me, oh, you, you, you're the only one who's not there. And I thought, no, these, you know, these children, there must be something wrong here. Uh, you know, nothing they say makes sense. Um, and um, I would say, oh, there's a woman across the street. And I thought, <laughs> I thought you know, this woman's really you know, overweight. And I, I thought, I said to them, well, that woman, is she there? And they said, no, but her son is there. And I was thinking, but she doesn't have a son. And then later when I was watching, you know, afterwards I was sort of observing and she has a son and I never knew she had a son, but they knew that the son was there. And also they disclosed on a different uh, occasion um, I was picking up Manipal of Torquay. After I had gone to the police, he was isolating. My ex was isolating himself in the bedroom and he was making a lot of phone calls to his family um, in our native country, uh, Skype calls. And he would always ask the children to speak to the grandfather or his youngest brother, their uncle. And uh, I picked up sort of manipulative talk and it sort of just and I went to the the three-year-old and I said to him does your father's family do the same and he said yes 
and I named they they basically family of seven. So I, I named the six other names. And he said yes to the grandfather and yes to the uncle. And when the eldest child came off the Skype call with his uncle, I asked him as well. And I said, do these people do this? And he said, yes. And I gave the names and he again said yes to the grandfather and yes to the uncle, the youngest brother. And uh, I got angry and I said to him, why do you do this? And he said to me, if we want to ride on the harvester, they live on a farm. And um, these were small children and they wanted to ride on the harvester. And apparently if they wanted to ride on the harvester, they had to do this. It was used as payment of sort. And um, I confronted him over this because then I suspected that he was obviously also, you know, uh, being, was molested or whatever as a child. And he didn't give me an answer. And he said, I'm recording you, which he did a lot. He was recording me practically permanently when he was at home. He was taking pictures of my handbag, pictures of the trash bin, apparently. I mean, he was just all over the show with the camera and recording. And apparently he also had my phone tapped, all the phones in the house tapped, and he had hired someone to listen in on all my conversations, which is something I just, I didn't know. I couldn't understand why he would know things that I had not told him. And uh, yeah, it, it's because he, he, he had, he hired someone to actually listen to all my conversations. And this is a guy who has a history of being in the, in the air force for eight years in the army, four years police training after that. And um, just to give you an idea, he was going to be involved in the Wonga coup with Mark Thatcher and, and Krauser style and Simon Mann, if you know what that is. It's no, I don't hired, hired soldiers, basically. Okay. Um, with his profession, he, he, he's, uh, he works with il, for the elite, basically. Oh, right. okay. Yeah. So he, he knows a lot of high-profile people. Um, yeah, and I suppose, you know, has, you know, can pull some strings to make sure everything goes right for him. Um, so... He, um, he filed for the divorce and then a social service worker arrived. Her name was Marisa Hansen. <laughs> and uh, I'm laughing because um, it's, it's, it's just mind-blowing. The, 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 the behavior was just mind-blowing. They had basically decided that I'm his abuser and that he's my victim. Your ex-husband. Hmm? Your ex-husband that you they decided that you yeah. were abusing your ex-husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's my victim. He's my domestic victim. I'm I'm dangerous, violent, mentally unstable, lost touch with reality. I can't remember what else she wrote in a report, but this report was held secret. Okay, I was not allowed to see it in this divorce. It was a it was an emergency, <laughs> emergency divorce. Now we weren't married under Luxembourgish law. We were married under our native country's law. And it, there is not even such a law that there is a law that if he can get me in a psychi psychiatric institution for six months, um, he can divorce me without my say. If he has a psychiatric evaluation, court evaluation, and a private evaluation declaring me mentally unstable, then he can also divorce me without my say. Or if I'm a habitual criminal, if he can prove I'm an habitual criminal, then he can also divorce me without my say. And obviously, this, these agendas were being pushed. Or if I'm dead, obviously, then, then he can also do that. But he, they were definitely pushing, you know, like, uh, he was saying, oh, she's provoking me. But you have to understand the concept. I mean, he's, he tells me he's called a pedophile, grabs my children in the crutches. And then he says, oh, she's provoking me. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> and they are very happy. And he, he had a very controlling, you know, because he, he's, he's a manipulator. Yeah, of course. So he's extremely controlling. So, and, so, so this social worker came in. So there was no court orders, no court appearances at that time. But yet this social, uh -uh. through the divorce, was uh -uh. able to do this secret assessment of you and then not let her see what's in there secret she just showed up and he initiated it with a diary into a, a child's protection court which is it's i'm, I'm gonna laugh i'll laugh straight off <laughs> because there's no such thing there, there, there's no protection no i mean their concept of i mean it, it's it's a freaking joke and i'm gonna tell you why Okay, because when I eventually did get a hold of this report, which was 
six months after they had given full custody of my children to this guy. What year was using this, this Carol? Report, so so mm-hmm. they disclosed in what year was this? So they did they disclose 2012. in 2011? So now we're in 2012, okay. We're in 2012, okay. So so when I eventually got, because when, when they were giving my children to this guy, and I mean, this was two weeks, it was quick. I mean, he filed for a divorce, 19, you know, uh, when was this? Uh, April, uh, 1st May, you know, 7 May, he was in court, you know, finished, full custody, <laughs> like that. I mean, it was fast. There was, yeah, it was wow. half an hour where they were going. There we go. Full custody to this wow. guy. He has no rights. No rights. Even my advocate said to me, you have no rights. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I was not allowed to see anything that they u- were using against me in the court. That, that was the other mind-blowing thing. I was going, what, <laughs> aren't I allowed to see <laughs> what you're using against me? And, and, my, and my advocate saying you have no mm-hmm. rights. And your own advocate, they, did they not even try and fight for you? You know, through this whole thing, the past 10 years, everybody I speak to say, where is your advocates? Yeah. I ask the same question. Because I'll tell you, I have the things I've... <laughs> I'm on my fourth advocate at the moment, but I mean, that's, that's another story. So the, um, the, no, she she basically, my advocate basically said to me, you have no rights. Don't fight. Wow. You were given no rights. Well, she, you know, she, she barely spoke English. She, the English was very bad. Um, but I mean, it was very fast. I mean, I, I, I found her to represent me on the Friday and the court hearing was on the Monday. Yeah, no, they were very quick on me. I, I mean, I didn't have, I was still in shock reeling from what my children said to me and they were pushing it through the court using the social service report. And um, I did manage to get a hold of the social service report because uh, I was told by my advocate, you're not allowed to see it. Why did you take the hamster to the police station? So I said to her, well, why don't you go and arrest Paris Hilton? She's got a dog in her handbag. You know, because the reality of it is, you don't throw someone out of their children's lives based on a hamster, a 10-year-old hamster. I mean, that's, that's just... what they were trying to do, say, for school or something like that. Is that where they were going with the hamster mm-hmm. situation? Oh, they were saying <laughs> the hamster, I'm, I'm going to quote from the social service report, the hamster ran all over their police station. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this was a huge thing. I mean, if you've ever seen youth police search for a hamster, I mean, that, that's just, it's absolute priority, apparently. You know, that's the, that's the impression that is created. I mean, it was a great crime and offence and child welfare, you know, issue. Um, anyway, he, he obviously, you know, my ex uh, went absolutely, I mean, it, it's like a compost for this manipulator. You know, it, it literally, he, he grows all the lies and exaggerations out of it and just adds stories and, you know, they build on the false impressions, whatever he wants to create. So in court, um, Carol, so they, so it was a divorce and then social mm-hmm. services got involved and it was through those, those proceedings that they just immediately just removed custody and the judge, mm. along with the social services, just colluded mm. and just... Uh, yeah, it, it was an emergency child protection procedure. Wow. Mm. So, so the, in their emergency child protection c- procedure, they gave children to a guy who, who walks around saying he's called a pedophile who prefers little boys. And that was their emergency child the protection procedures. <laughs> huh? And grabs the crotches and the children have disclosed yeah. in age-appropriate language mm-hmm. about what he did to them as well. And yeah, mm-hmm. you'll see. Yes, but you must remember my children did not disclose. And that is why they were able to say, oh, she suffers from delusional psychosis, but not immediately. Initially, my advocate just said to me, because they gave him full custody, my advocate said to me, it's full temporary custody. My advocate said to me, uh, they say you're crazy. You need to go to to get a psychiatric evaluation at the hospital. So for three days, I tried to get into the psychiatric hospital because now apparently I'm, I'm... stark raving mad and they refuse to accept me i see the head of intake a dr Hedo, and he's also asking me why did you take the hamsters to the police station and i'm thinking why are these people so obsessed with the hamster and not about the children 
Yeah, no, the, the children doesn't feature as the hamsters apparently. But any, anyway, I'm I'm gonna laugh, but it's ironic laughter if if this. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so so they refused. They put me on a waiting list, and uh, I went to see an outside psychiatrist at that point. And he wrote to the court saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with these, you know, no psychiatric deviations. You know, it's my in circumstances that are causing, you know, issues. Um. And uh, at that point, my advocate said to me, keep quiet. She said, do not speak about child molestation. Okay. The advocate I had, she said to me, keep quiet. And I thought, I'll <laughs> gladly forget what I've heard. And he also said to me, my ex, after he got custody, he said to me, if you carry on speaking about child molestation, your children will go to an orphanage. And he also said to me, when I said to him, I'll never give up. He said to me, you will never see your children again. Yeah. Now, this is a guy who has like 35 witness testimonies written into court about what a fabulous, fabulous guy he is. Kind, nice, generous, honest, (laughs) which which I laugh about. Uh, Did I say generous? Righteous. Righteous was another thing that was written. This is his eldest brother, right? He's righteous and good at keeping secrets. This is a testimony to court. Oh, yeah. I'm looking yeah, at this thing here. Like this that's an interesting one. Mm. And uh, another woman, right, his good characteristics will take another 10 pages. Wow. And I don't know the woman. I don't know. I don't know her from a bar stuff. Never met her. Half the, uh, not half the people, most of the people on that, they've never been in my house. I mean, I don't know them. And I'm thinking, who are you? They, yeah. They're ranting and raving yeah, about yeah. what a fabulous yeah. guy he is. Yes. And I don't know them. Co- Never been got, did your ex-husband know loads of people then? Oh, yeah, yeah. From yeah, all yeah. walks he of had, life. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a long list of people that he knew yeah. and was on his contact list and who he would regularly contact. Uh, he would rotate it every three to four months. This is what occupied his afternoons is phoning these people and creating false impressions about what a, what a nice guy he is mm-hmm. in, in the, in the listener's head. Uh, that's what I called it because that's what it was. And he would repeat the same thing over and over. And uh, something he did repeat to them was um, lying is, is bad. Bad people lie. This is something he repeated to these so it's people. Like, so he's using kind of like, neuralistic programming to kind of you know repetition 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 to try and get them to yeah it's an impression of who he is exactly yeah 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 interesting but sort of in like creating the impression in their heads that he is you know not a lie because he's calling them bad people but <laughs> he would put the phone down and he would laugh at them and he would call them stupid yeah yeah I, I, that sounds like somebody like somebody i was married to let's just say yeah that that's a, a narcissistic characteristic yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Carol, so, the, so you, custody was immediately removed. What happened then? So you, we're now in 2012. So your custody was immediately removed. So the, mm. the children are then, they're placed with him straight away, your ex-husband. Mm, yeah, I was thrown out of the house at midnight. You are kidding me. Mm-mm. Who threw, who threw you out? Was he, it he, um, because I was waiting... <laughs> stupidly my advocate said to me go to the hospital and try to be admitted so I waited there for five hours until about 11 o'clock at night and then I eventually went home and when I came home he threw me out oh gosh he said to me from now on you will live in the apartment he it's a Jimmy house so there's an apartment above the house and he gave me the keys and he said to me, you will now go live there. And my advocate, because he found the police on me. I mean, this is all, a, there's so much details. He found the police on me saying that I slapped him. And he found the police saying that oh, I pushed him into a fish tank and a violent and blah, blah, blah. And um, <laughs> yeah. So this I didn't, he fabricated. So he fabricated saying you were violent to him and he made it all up. He literally made the, all of this stuff up. And the police Yeah, no, he was saying I was provoking him. Let me give you an example of the provocation. I would come back from somewhere with the children and he would, we would get out of the car. Now, this is a guy who knew that this is what I had been saying. You know, there's no, uh, he, he, he doesn't, I'm trying to keep, he knows that I'm trying to keep my children in my sight, basically. I mean, this is just normal. You know, you're not going to 
say, here's the child, you know, take the child where yeah. you want. Your child, had, my child had just said, you make food from your penis. You know, there you exactly. go. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to, to stay near my children. And he was aware of this. And he was trying to lure them away um, from that. And he knew it was causing me anxiety and stress. And, uh, and he just put the pressure on. He was having loads of fun, this guy. Um, so was this after you'd lost custody, Carol, he was doing this? You sorry? Were, was this after you lost custody? No, this was the last month after I had reported to the police, oh, after right. my children had said, but, yeah. No, he, when, was, he was just... So when you'd lost custody, what happened then? Mm. Were you still seeing your children? What was the process then? I was living above my yeah. children. My well, children were underneath right. me. Yeah. So I could hear them crying. I could hear them screaming. I could, you know, uh, my my child, my eldest child would try and, you know, he would ring the doorbell of the apartment because it had separate, it was right next to each other, but, you know, separate doors. And uh, they would come and fetch him away and they would tell him, your mother is sick. You can't go to her. And um, I would see my children out the window. Uh, he would threaten me that if he sees me outside, he's going to call the police. If I'm outside while my children are outside, his eldest brother came through from our native country and physically restrained my children from coming to me while they were crying. Oh. Um, my youngest child was two years old. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Um, yeah. And they were doing this all saying, oh, we're protecting the children. This is horrifying. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, yeah. So, so then they said, okay, he and the social service worker, I got no rights from the court, but he and the social service worker, Marisa Hansen, decided I could see my children one hour every day. This was initially after he got full custody, a full temporary custody. And, um, she, <laughs> they started this, but I soon realized that this was a sort of a, a manipulative, I don't know if it was, <sighs> I'll give you an example. It would be used as a punishment. If, if, if I say something wrong, you know, for example, my, my three-year-old will say to me, you know, pray to Jesus. And I say, yes, I do. And then he would say to his father, uh, Jesus did not make you good. <laughs> this is what he literally says to his father. He says, you take me to other people as well. And his father would say, where do I do that? Where do I do that? I don't do that. And, um, and then I would say to the child, I believe you. And then he would chase me out. He right. would say to me, get out. So yeah. he, would supervise, the child. he would supervise you. You were the yeah, 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 he was obviously, he was supervising because he's apparently the normal guy, you see. Yeah, and, um, yeah, exactly. So how, yeah. long, how long did this, three how weeks. How long did this go on for the one hour a day? Three weeks. Three weeks. And then what? About three weeks. And then he flew the children to our native country and left them for about three weeks uh, on his parents' farm. And during that time, I tried to phone my children and, and uh, they would put the phone down on me and say, um, I manipulate the children. I scare the children with lion stories of lions, <laughs> yeah. which is really funny because the eldest brother, his eldest brother, um, bought them uh, the movie, the DVD, The Lion King. Now, my children had nightmares of animals by their bed. Yeah. And... Um, uh, this was something three-year-old especially he was complaining of an elephant and or a, a lion by his bed at night you know having nightmares of that mm -hmm. and um yeah so so I suspect this Lion King movie was to you know sort of cover up the lion nightmares okay. that the children were having because this is another sign of child molestation as a child having nightmares like of, it absolutely yeah. is, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a very common sign. So, yeah, so what, I wanted to keep it in what origin. happened after they, they were taken to your native country for three weeks? What, oh, you? he he bought me a ticket. He bought me a ticket to my native country. And um, he, he uh, basically manipulated not all my family members, but uh, my eldest brother, basically, to believe that I'm mentally unstable and um, that I need psychiatric treatment <laughs> which he then booked at a hospital for me, yeah, and um, and then they started saying, you know, and then I went, I went 
I took the sticker and I, I went. My children were then over there, but I and while the the day he boxed it for that I flew, flew over there, he came back with the children to Luxembourg. So while I was there, I looked for help. I thought, you know, I have to find some help somewhere. And um, the uh, he came through about a month and a half later with the children on holiday, on the summer holiday, also to our native country. And I approached the court and I asked the court to have my children um, evaluated for sexualization in their mother language. And also I requested that the children be in my care while it was, you know, uh, being done. And I was a Hague international kidnapping application arrived oh, in our native oh. country. Yeah. And uh, I was looking at this. They send it to me. They were sending it around the court. His advocate, because, uh, you know, he obviously got his advocate there. And, and they were sending this to everybody, the children's advocate's office, you know, everybody involved, the children's advocate, the, everybody involved were getting this Hague application. And his advocate stood in court and said, the mother needs to be found guilty of kidnapping. Oh, so it was a setup then. <laughs> It was a complete <laughs> no, no, I'm sitting. No, it, it, I suspect so, and I'll tell you why. The first in our native country, it works different. Um, we I, I make the application, and then he has time to respond. And in this response, the order that came through after my initial request was she can go fetch her children to have them evaluated. And I was listening to this. In the short version, it's written like that. In the longer version, it's not. So on initial glance, yes, she can go fetch her children. But in the longer version, it says, on con uh, depending on their response. So I was, <laughs> so if I had gone and fetched my children, then I would have, you know, basically been kidnapping them. So it was a sort of a, you know, there was a, there was a loophole yeah. that, that was waiting behind the scenes. And, um, but my name was not on this Hague application. It was the other thing. Although they were arguing in court, which was not a Hague court, which was a court I asked for my children to be assessed, they were arguing in this non Hague court that I be found guilty of kidnapping. <laughs> and everyone was pondering should I be found guilty of kidnapping? I think for two months while I had not kidnapped a child. And they were saying, we cannot look into the best interest of the children because of the pending Hague application. And this he writes openly. He also wrote openly in his documents um, with when I was saying, you know, this is the sexualized behavior of the children that I picked up. He'd say, yeah, um, mindful of their ages. Let me just get what he quote what he said. Mindful of their ages, he does not find it surprising that the children will play with themselves and each other and discover sexual gratification together. Wow. So that was this is a guy who writes in his book, people say he's called a pedophile. Was that the judge? No, this is my ex. He said that. You're right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Mm. My ex said that. Sorry, my ex said that in court. No, the judges were. I'll tell you what the, what the judge did do. There were different judges, three judges, uh, on different sections of this process. But <laughs> the one judge uh, went to my advocate and said if she, because I had made a case against, I also included his parents, the, the grandfather, also yeah. the grandmother, sorry, yeah. and the, the youngest uncle in this court case. And the judge approached my advocate and said to him, if she withdraws the case against the grandfather and the youngest uncle, it increases her chances that we'll have the children assessed. Wow. So um, I, I, I agreed. I said, okay, you know, if it increases the chances, then do it. And um, yes, no, that, that was just, and then obviously his advocate stood in court and said, oh, she's not serious. She withdrew the charges against the, the oh, so grandfather and the youngest yeah. brother. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, oh, right. Okay. That's the game. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they basically concluded, the judge did a language evaluation because there were so many lies. Oh, I cannot explain to you the amount of lies. They were arguing that the children had already been assessed in, in Luxembourg and that the children speak 
uh, spoke, you know, every language and that everybody could understand them. And this was all trash. I mean, they were lying through their teeth. Um, I, I became vindictive and vexatious and it, it was just, you know, in these court documents. Yeah. Um, the Oh, this is a very long story. Yeah. What was the outcome of that particular hearing? What uh, of that case? Oh, nothing. Nothing. They basically allowed him. Yeah. They they did a language assessment on the children. Uh, the language assessment proved that the children could only speak our native language and and was not fluent in any other language. And then they said, okay, go back to a country where there is no person speaking that language because they can take care of you. This was the decision. And that I'm vindictive and vexatious for having requested that my children be evaluated in the language that they can speak. Yeah. So and well, then he drove over my child. Sorry. And then while we were still there, he drove over the middle child. What? Yeah. He drove, he, he loaded what? the children no. unsupervised on the back of a wagon, reversed, one fell off and he drove over him, basically. And everyone was just saying how normal. Oh, no, no, no. That's just a normal accident. It's okay. I was one of the, so, oh, the social service report. That's where I got the social service report from, where I finally saw it, because this also came through with the Hague application. Yeah. And um, wow. so the he, things he, in he, there. The child could have died and they're just yeah. sweeping it under the carpet saying it's No, they just sweep it under the carpet. There's nothing. On the contrary, they it made it, they sort of created the impression that he was the victim. That shame the poor guy, you know. <laughs> he drove over his child, shame. No, no, care for the child. It, it was, uh, I was absolutely, I, I don't know. You know, you, you don't know. You, you, and, and you must remember, in this court hearing, they were fighting against me. They, Luxembourg hired advocates, family advocates, to fight against me and basically argue that the children should not be assessed. Yeah. So what, what happened after that, Carol? What was the... He brought what, what he, he happened, drove over the child. And, sorry? What has happened between this court case and, and present day? What, what's the like the outcome of your Nothing. situation? They, they've, they've kept on on the same route. The mother is mentally unstable. When I came back from, from our native country, back to Luxembourg, um, <laughs> he, they just carried on on the same track. They basically then, only this was at the end of 2012, I came back. And uh, the first thing they did was uh, order a psychiatric evaluation of me. They, they, they didn't do oh, they, it they a year to, ago. Yeah, they love to do that, don't they? Yeah. So then they said, oh, wait, hold on. We now need a psychiatric evaluation of this woman. She was in another court. We had nothing. <laughs> so then they send me to this guy, Mark Glass, and he decides I am delusional psychotic for oh. fearing for the welfare of my children. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and it's very and, uh, easy for them to do that. I mean, if you don't agree with the judge's findings or whatever, you, they can just say delusional. It's very easy for them to say delusional very. because um, my children didn't speak at, up, up at the police, and this even is when, usually when they say, say delusional. Can I just mm -hmm. say, Carol? Even when your children speak to the police and disclose to other people like-minded, you can still be called delusional. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah. So this is, you know, that, and that's with children disclosing to social services, to the police. You can still be called delusional for believing them. Okay, well, they, they had this delusional certificate and they decided, okay, now I can see my children two hours every two weeks under supervision. When was that decision made? What uh, it was it was given in January 2013, and then it was executed in April 2013. And are you uh, still having the same contact today? Yes, th there were some deviations in so the model. So we're eight mm. years on, eight years on, yeah. and then you are still Basically. only seeing your children as a visitor, mm. as a play visitor. Two days a year. It totals up it, to two yeah. days a year. This is. I'm not allowed telephonic contact either. Yeah, no, no, no telephonic contact, no Skype, no nothing, because I have to be supervised. I'm such a danger. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I came back to, to Luxembourg, um, it, he had hired nannies and he, part of their, their employment, whatever it was, was to record me uh, when I greet my children or when I'm round about to so say they recorded me every time they saw me. And this lasted for about two and a half years. 
um, they were telling the children not to speak to me. And apparently, according to my children, also beat them if they spoke to me. Um, they, my children were saying to me that they're only allowed to greet me, but not speak to me. And during this period of, of living like in this really insane, creative environment for me and my children, I mean, these people were having an absolute ball recording. I mean, they were, yeah. they were just, you know, they were smiling while holding their, their phones. And, um, and uh, anyway, I was, uh, I, I would buy during the visitation, I would give children, my children presents. And one of the presents I gave them was a, was a toy camera. And I gave it to them at the end of 2013. And I had this thing with them that if it was broken, that they would leave it out on the communal stairs and, you know, that I will replace it or try and fix it, et cetera. And on this occasion in 2015, they left a camera. And um, I managed to get it working at the beginning of 2016. And I took a picture of myself and I thought, oh, you know, I'm just going to have a look at the picture. And I couldn't get to it on this toy thing. It was really frustrating. So I connected it to my, cam to my computer and up pops these naked pictures of my children posing on his bed. Yeah. Wow. So I freaked. I freaked. Wow. Uh, I unplugged the thing. And I thought, you know, I, I didn't see this. <laughs> it's, this, wait, is wait, wait, this is, this is coming from a long time of people trying to convince you you're crazy. Huh? <laughs> you don't were they, were they explicit? Just yeah. Were mm -hmm. they explicit photographs? Yeah, of course they were naked. Did the children were, what were it, it, Yeah, it wasn't just a child standing. You know, they were posing, posing with the uh, backsides in the air. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the pictures were taken focused on their private parts. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it wasn't just, you know, a child is naked. It's nothing, it's, just an innocent, yeah. Nothing no, no, innocent. no. It's not just, uh, you know. Sure. Yeah. Um, anyway. And um, so I freaked. And uh, the, a few days later, I went back into the to camera to make sure that I had, had actually seen this because it was so, you know, had, did I, didn't I? And uh, when I, I, I stumbled across a picture of my eldest child and he had this big smile on his face and everything was clearly visible in this picture. But anyway, and uh, I freaked, uh, I lost it and I started deleting the pictures. And uh, then I stopped. And I took the camera and I put it in a corner. I said, I can't give this camera to these people because it'll disappear. Yeah. Um, I cannot go around sending naked pictures of my children saying, please help me because be they will charge me with, you know, yeah. all kinds yeah, of trash, pull out yeah. whatever they can. They'll blame it. And, um, yeah. And on the other hand, they're going to just, you know, minimize it and yeah. dismiss it and, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And I was 100% correct. 100% correct. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, they, they they are just, I cannot tell you, I eventually, I didn't report it at that point, because I was thinking, how am I going to do this? And uh, then I um, saw a video uh, on YouTube about the boy with the henna tattoo. It was about this pedophile group called Boy Lovers Network. Don't know if you know about this. No. And it, uh, the leaders were in Australia. Peter Thron, and I don't know what the other guy's name is, but um, one of the police officers who was talking on this documentary, we're talking about pictures of the boy, um, and he was, the boy was leaning against a wall, and he just didn't have his shirt on, he was saying, this is a sexualized picture, you know, it's, it, the, and I thought, wow, you know, that guy thinks that, that picture is sexualized, he should see the pictures of my children. And um, so I contacted this guy and I sent him the pictures. And he said to me, it's disturbing. And they contacted Luxembourg. And at that point, I had contacted a an officer here. And I said, because I got the idea to censor the pictures. And in that manner, I could, you know, seek help. And um, the, the, they contacted Luxembourg and Luxembourg asking them what is going on. You know, what, what, what also Task Force Argos, I contacted Task Force Argos as well. I'm um, basically looking for backup to confirm oh, that okay. my opinion of this is not delusional. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, 
And uh, they also said, this is incorrect. I contacted the prosecutor's office in our native country who was involved at that point as well. And, and they also contacted Luxembourg. I contacted Interpol in our native country as well. And they also contacted, contacted Luxembourg. And with all this, Luxembourg said, no, no, we're not sending you anything. We're still investigating. And this was after I had gone to the police. Now, I didn't report with the original camera. I that used was about Poppy. four or five years ago, was it? This was 2018. Okay, right. Yeah, this was so just beginning 2018. Um, and um, no, well, Interpol came a bit later because then I realized because there was a dead silence. Sure. It was just an absolute dead silence. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so so I realized, you know, they were they were going to end. But I had no idea to what extent they were going to do this. In. <laughs> that was the thing. Um, you know, to what extent they will actually write in reports normal interaction. Why that there would be people saying to me, "Oh, we want a meeting with you," and then sitting yeah in my living room saying to me, "That is normal development." Wow! You must remember that you are mentally unstable and that your opinion counts for nothing. Well, and then they add, "What kind of a person would say that that was normal?" Oh, this is um, uh, well one. Uh, was a uh, Roland Mueller from the, the Ed Department of Children's Education of Luxembourg. Uh, they call it ONE. And he said to me, it's normal development for children in Luxembourg to look like that. Now, remember, my children's about age seven. <laughs> normal. It's not normal. It's not like that. There's nothing <laughs> normal about that. Okay, well, that's what they call it. Okay, they're saying you are crazy for fearing for the welfare of your yeah. children. Yeah, that that's is normal. Yeah. Okay. In, in, in the culture of this country, that is called normal. Children apparently look like this, and I'm crazy for fearing for yeah. children. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it just children tells you look like that who, who, are the, who these people are in these positions in child protective services, social services, family court. It just tells you a lot about who these people are and what's normal for them. Mm, but the latest one. not normal. The latest one was um, uh, psychiatric. The, the judge uh, in, the, in the recent court case was still busy, um, ordered a psychiatric evaluation again of me. This is seven years after the last one. Uh, ordered another psychiatric evaluation and also this time asking for a psychiatric evaluation of my ex. And basically... And this was after a development where he, it was discovered that he was, uh, you know, my children are under the impression that there's a restraining order against me, which there isn't. But he, they were convinced that I'm not allowed 100 meters in their vicinity because I'm dangerous. Um, and uh, he had basically, he's, he basically goes around telling people this. He's, he's telling them my appeal was rejected. When my appeal was not rejected, I won the appeal and he lost it, his, his restraining order was rejected. That, that was about the only normal judge I encountered. Right. Um, but anyway, so, so she ordered a psychiatric evaluation. It took them, I'm not kidding you. Oh, if I tell you it took, it was ridiculous. I think it took almost six, seven months for, for this guy to do, to, to finally do his, you know, psychiatric report. And uh, when it came through, no, I, I sent those pictures to the guy, I emailed it to him, and um, his conclusion was it's normal interaction. There's another one. Dr. Jacques Bernard, the mother is, meant, uh, is delusional, psychotic. You know, the mother is, suffers from delusion. This is normal interaction. And this, uh, the judge, we were in court and the judge, would, but when my, because the psychi psychiatric evaluation of him consists of two sentences saying he, he takes his responsibility as a parent seriously and something else, non-specific one. And uh, so my advocate was saying, well, uh, you know, he wasn't really psychiatrically evaluated. And the judge said, oh, but, but there's no reason to psychiatrically evaluate him. Of course not. Mm, no, it's, it's normal. Normal it's interaction. Just, people wouldn't have a clue, would they? As a you know, not knowing anything about child protective services, you just you would just assume that these people would help you, would would take measures to protect your child, to investigate, 
But once you're in this hellhole, it, it, there's no going back. I mean, it's just, it's just a, your story is horrific, um, as are mm. many of our yeah, stories it, are horrific. It's, it's the irony of, of the whole thing. It's, it's like going, oh, she's mentally unstable, violent, dangerous, but they yeah. have absolutely no evidence. It's a and then they say no child sex abuse took place, mm. you know, we don't have any evidence. So, so no child sex abuse took place, yeah. but she's mentally unstable, violent, and yeah. dangerous. But yeah. we don't need evidence for that. We just accept it. Yeah, that, that's it's, the it's thing. It's, like, it's one thing to say, oh, this hasn't happened. But then it's another thing to entirely criminalize, criminalize the parent who's bringing it up and trying to protect the children. But this, is, this is a pedophile, pedophile argument. This is the, the, These are what pedophile groups argue, that it's not... They argue that what they're doing is normal. Yeah. I bet if you did a survey of, of thousands of people throughout the world about, you know, showing them the pictures that you found, I wonder what percentage of us would be found delusional for thinking that they're not normal. No. <laughs> Everyone who does not like child sex media. Yeah, we're all delusional. delusional <laughs> psychotic for fearing for children's welfare. This is their argument. Yeah. I mean, it, and I can, I'm sitting there thinking, don't these people realise what they're doing? But I, 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 it's it's crazy, Carol. We we've, we've just got literally just five five minutes left, and then we've done an hour. So mm -hmm. I know you wanted to finish. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to touch on the on the on the incredible social service report which they used. Um, who she she was concentrating on where might I take a goldfish? Um, where hamsters were another thing. Uh, chaos. There's toys on a carpet. Um, she mentioned my weight. Apparently, I'd lost weight, uh, which I hadn't. Um, I, I had a changed sense of humor. I've never met her before. Um, I, I burn food. This is very bad. Yeah. Uh, burning food is, is a child endangerment. Uh, uh, many other things that you, you can't. They'll just use anything against you, these people. They'll, they'll use, you couldn't do yeah. anything, just breathe and it's wrong. It's a danger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it, it, but, I mean, just to give you an example. Oh, my children climb trees. That's, uh, I have, a, I, have a, a, I don't know how they pronounce it, but a relaxed attitude towards the welfare of my children. So what about the man who knocked over one of your children? Oh, you mean drove over? Yeah. Oh, no. yeah, sorry, it's a bit. The, the, oh, no, 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 no. That, that's just me wanting to attack him. Yeah. That was the next social service worker. That, that, that's nothing. That's just me wanting to attack him. So, Carol, I have a problem how, with him. How are your children? I know this might be a bit a hard question to, um, to answer, mm -hmm. but how, how are your children? <sighs> Very confused. Uh, I don't, I don't know exactly, I, you know, I see them two hours every two weeks. Um, I don't speak to them about this stuff. I try to play games with them and, you know, give them whatever, because he, he also states in court that he uses them as his French court document translator since the age of six, which is also apparently normal in the country of Luxembourg, because there's no one in the population he could hire to translate documents except his children. Yeah, to involve them in all the conflict. Now, this guy, I think he's made like seven eviction hearings against me. Oh, and our marital contract, basically, um, you know, he's they, they, they can't execute that either because I'm supposed to get basically almost half of his assets. And they, obviously they can't do that because how do they, how do they, they have to benefit the, the guy who says he's called a pedophile? Um, even my advocate I discovered was, you know, basically... Working for the guy, her name was Anna Sophie Gredon. I'll say her name. She, she, I discovered she was basically looking after his interests. It's it's a it's a rabbit hole once you once you start investigating it and looking what's going on in this system. It's it's just horrific. So, but we we just have to keep fighting, don't we? And just stay strong and just you know. I mean, I for one won't be stopping until I get this. You know, do my part in exposing the system. Um, mm. So I hope that you know. This interview helps to wake many other people up to warn other people that this 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 kind of thing can just happen to anyone. You know, just normal mums and dads sometimes. It's it's just a it's just a nightmare. So thanks so much for sharing your story, Carol. And um, I wish you all the best, obviously. And I, I hope one day this you know you you can start living life again. And you know and you know yeah, me too. And I hope my children will also be able to be okay after this. Yeah.
well i'll um you, you take care thanks for coming you on too. bye thanks thank you for interviewing you're very welcome bye bye bye